These are the five best decks in Historic right now. Use these to hit Mythic fast. The fifth best deck is Azorius Auras. This deck does it all. Draws lots of cards, makes huge creatures, a bit of disruption, and really quite resilient. So starting with the creatures, you've got Core Spirit Dancer and Sram, both of which draws you so many cards. One every single time you cast an aura whilst they're on the battlefield. Then you have the creatures like Esper Sentinel and Hushbringer, which disrupt your opponent and slow down the game plan, buying you enough time to make mammoth-like creatures. Then there's Selfless Savior, which makes sure your large creatures stay on the battlefield for as long as they possibly can. It's also worth mentioning that Lurus is your companion. Lurus gives you some late game resilience if you run out of fuel and works really well with Selfless Saviour, giving you a way to protect your creatures once every turn. Lurus can even bring back your auras. So the deck runs an assortment of auras, some of which focus on drawing you cards, others help to make your creatures more evasive, and then some of the auras just make your creatures bigger. This deck is very good at being explosive and closing games out fast. However, this deck is also fantastic at drawing you cards, which really helps it to hold up in the mid to late game too. The biggest weakness of this deck is if your opponent can remove Core Spirit Dancer or SRAM before they draw you another one. Early removal and discard cards are the main threat you've got to worry about here. Coming in fourth, we have Esper Reanimator. This deck uses Unburial Rites, Late to Dinner and Priest of Fell Rites to return large creatures to the battlefield from the graveyard. But what are we actually bringing back? Well, the deck includes Praetors, Massacre Worm and Serra's Emissary, all of which are better or worse depending on the deck you're currently facing. For example, Massacre Worm is great versus Elves, but really sucks versus Control. To actually reanimate these creatures, you have to mill yourself so that they're in your graveyard first. Or you could use cards like Faithful Mending and Bone Shards to discard any of the expensive creatures that actually made it to your hand. The real strength of this deck is its brute force. These creatures are expensive for a reason. Reanimating them early can give you a huge tempo swing and this can really help to end the games fast. Then obviously the biggest weakness is Graveyard Hate but thankfully in Best of Ones and pre sideboard this is far less common. However some of the decks these days are including it in the main deck. In fact, we even include it in ours, thinking of Ashiok. So just make sure that you always prioritize the graveyard hate whenever you cast Fortsies. If you think this deck is good, wait until you see the next one. Third place is Lotus Control, which is a control deck with a twist. The card the deck's named after is actually a land, Lotus Field, which taps for free mana of any color and has hexproof. But when it enters the battlefield, you sacrifice two lands. Well, not in this deck. Cards like Stifle, Strict Proctor and Discontinuity are two or one mana cards that stop you from sacking the lands. Can you see why this deck is doing well now? The rest of the deck is your usual control cards. Counter spells, removal, board wipes, all of which slow your opponent down and actually controls the game and how it's played. Once you feel like you have control of the game, you'd use cards like Memory Deluge and Teferi to dig through your deck and find your win cons. Approach the Second Sun, Shark Typhoon, or maybe you're just going to win with Teferi himself. The strength of this deck is being able to dictate how the game is played with cards like Teferi and Wrath of God, and now Lotus Field just helps you to get to that state faster. A weakness of this deck is instant speed threats. I'm thinking of Shark Typhoon, Collected Company, and Night Pack Ambushers. They're all problems. This is mainly because their decks will apply enough pressure that we have to board wipe to restore the control. But then, if they cast these after the board wipe resolves, it could be really tough for us to recover. Number two is Selesnia Squirrel Combo, which is actually sort of an aggro deck too. The main game plan is the combo though, using Soul Warden or Lunarch's Veteran or Prosperous Innkeeper to gain you a life whenever a creature enters the battlefield. But then if you also have Heliod out, each time you gain that life, you can put a plus one plus one counter on a creature. The final piece of the combo is Scurry Oak. When it enters the battlefield, you gain a life from the Soul Warden, let's say, then you put the counter from Heliod onto the Scurry, this then triggers Scurry's ability, creating you a Squirrel, which begins the cycle again. Now that's one powerful three card combo to win you the game. 
The backup plan uses Trellisara and Voice of the Blessed and Skyclave Apparition to play the usual white weenie game plan, which tends to happen more often than you might think. The real strength of this deck though is its versatility and resilience, shifting its game plan depending on the matchup. Versus aggro decks, you can lean in on the life gain and try to race with big creatures, whereas versus mid-range decks, it might work a little bit better to lean into your combo. A weakness this deck faces is disruption. Whether it's counter spells, removals, or worst of all, discard from cards like Fort Seas and Inquisition of Kozilek. All of these are stopping, or at the very least slowing, whichever game plan you choose to follow. This deck's good, we've got to wait until you see what came in first. This week, the best performing deck is Red Deck wins again. It was the best last week too. So this deck's all about speed. So let's just go through the mana curve from one to four. One drops with haste is how the deck likes to begin. Both of which have some additional utility as well throughout the rest of the game. Following them are the two drops, which either refresh your mana or gain you card advantage or just offer you excellent rates for their cost. The three drops include Goblin Chain Whirler and Rampaging Ferocidon, which are both positioned excellently in the current meta. Alongside them is Bone Crusher Giant, which is so powerful it's even included in modern deck lists. Finishing the curve, we have Torbrun, Fane of Red Fell. Four mana is usually considered a little bit too greedy in mono red aggro decks, however, this card can single handedly win you the game the turn you play it, making it well worth the cost. It's also important to mention the lands. Den of the Bugbear is a fantastic mana land which offers a lot of pressure, and Ruminap Ruins, which is used as a little bit of extra burn to finish the game out. The strength of this deck is its consistency and the fact it has an obvious game plan to follow. You always know what you need to do. But don't be mistaken, this deck does have a bad rep for being easy to play. Sure, the deck's easy to pick up, but it is a lot harder to master. A weakness of this deck is a big beefy blocker that can easily eat your smaller creatures, also board wipes and even just life gain in general. Though thankfully, cards like Rampage and Ferocidon and Roiling Vortex can help versus the life gain at the very least. If you liked any of these decks, you can find links to all of them in the description below. Next week, we should hopefully see the impact of the ban and restricted announcement. Reworked Fairy should definitely see some sort of play in a deck or two. Like, subscribe, and see you next week.